Hey, everyone. Today's guest and co-host is Christina Ricci, coming fresh off an Emmy nomination for her amazing performance on the Showtime series Yellow Jackets. Christina and I talk about how she slept through the nomination announcements, being unintentionally funny, navigating friendships as an actor, the appeal of isolation, not-so-irrational fears, why she considers her current relationship the first time she's been in love, and a lot more. Our first caller is Jace, who, for the second time, discovered his long-term partner sending flirtatious messages and photos to other men. Now Jace is wondering if the relationship is worth trying to save, or if once a cheater, always a cheater. Next, we talk with Wanda, who recently returned to the office after gaining weight during the pandemic, only to face an incessant number of comments about her appearance. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you have a question and would like to talk with us, we would love to hear from you. Just look for the link at unqualified.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Christina, congratulations. Oh, thanks. As a person who's never experienced an Emmy nomination, (laughs) will you tell me your adventure with this? Well, I don't have a lot of experience with this myself. And the last time I was nominated for anything was a SAG award like four or five years ago that nobody expected me to get nominated for. So like I came out of Soul Cycle and they called me and they're like, it's so weird, but you got nominated for a SAG award. And like, that was it. So I didn't do interviews or there was nothing to it. It was just like, okay, we'll check back in with you later. You know what I mean? And then this time, I guess, because I have been doing the whole thing, I knew they were being announced at 830. I did not know that I was expected to be up and like watching or whatever. I wouldn't know that either. Yeah. Right. And I didn't know that there would be activities for me afterwards that I was supposed to engage. I didn't know. I really did not know. Like it's been so long since, I don't know, whatever. So I have an eight month old baby and she was teething all night and she's been teething. So she hasn't been sleeping much. So my husband and I have been switching off and on nights so that at least every other night you feel rested. But this (laughs) night I took the baby because I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to sleep anyway. We're waiting to see what happens tomorrow. And then she literally (laughs) slept half hour increments for the whole night long. And I didn't sleep. And so finally I like brought my husband, the baby at 7 a.m. I was like, just take her. I have to sleep. And I just slept through it. He came up at 8.30 or 8.45 and was like, babe, you got nominated. And I was like, sweet. Now I can really sleep. And then I woke up an hour later to like crazy messages and voicemails. And like, we've been calling Mark and we're trying to call you. And like, I was supposed to be on the phone doing phone interviews, but I did not know that. Well, let me preface this question by telling you. So Amy Poehler once told me a long time ago, she had been nominated for an Emmy, I think seven or eight times (laughs) and she didn't win. And she told me, you know, I know I'm not going to win. I know I'm not going to win. But there is that moment when you're in the audience and you hear your name being called and involuntarily, I hold my breath in hope. Well, I have this problem. My problem is that like anytime I've ever been nominated for anything, I hate public speaking so much that I would rather lose than have to give a speech. So literally, I've been in the audience and just been like, no, not me, not me. Please not me. (laughs) So I need to get past that because like my husband was like, but that's terrible. That means you're always going to get in your own way of succeeding. If you're like, you know what? It's okay because success means I'll have to like do something I'm uncomfortable with. So no, (laughs) no, we'll just, I'll just stay here at the table. (laughs) So I don't know. Do you think that that is a quality though that's like, incongruous to your career? Yeah. Yes. It is difficult. I mean, I'm not very comfortable actually with attention. I don't like it. I don't need a lot of attention. I like acting, but I don't, you know, like doing photo shoots and stuff. And I'm just half the time I'm like, all right, well, I could just go home, (laughs) you know, and like having people ask me lots of junkets and analyzing everything you've done. Right. Don't sit around and think about this, guys. (laughs) Right. I think that there may be a misconception about the idea that actors like are comfortable speaking in public or that they're good poker players. I went to my high school reunion, my 20th. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was like a solid B of a night, you know? (laughs) (laughs) 
It was fine. <laughs> but what I was grateful for was that a lot of people that I interacted with remembered me the way I remembered myself, which was really quiet, really under the radar. Like I just laid low. I was a really short kid. Making friends did not come easily to me. Mm -hmm. I was always like in awe of girls who related to other girls in a way that I felt like I couldn't. And it still sometimes feels like a different language or language pattern or behavior pattern. And I don't know if that's because I enjoy my own company <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> right. It feels like these are similar ideas. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have a really hard time with, I call it the group thought and group dynamics and, you know, everyone has to agree. I'm always the person at the table that's like, oh, everybody loves that song, but you, Christina, hilarious. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I just... <laughs> so yeah, I don't have that same thing. And like when I was in school, I mean, I was working from the time I was really little. So I was social, but I was very surfacey. I didn't have very deep connections. Yeah. If I was going to try to find like what my journey has been or whatever with some sort of headline, I guess it would just be learning really to trust myself over the years. You know, I kind of really started out from a place of I don't know anything. Everybody else must be right because I don't know anything. And like entered this industry with that point of view, which isn't great, frankly. I think that's one of the problems with entering it as a child is that you really don't know anything. So then everybody else you come in contact gets to influence you. And like, I believed everything everyone told me. And also in particular, because I was an actress, it was all sort of telling me how I should be and who I should be and how I need to change. And finally, I was like, this isn't right. This isn't working. And it took me so long to take out like, oh, that isn't actually something I would have naturally done. Let's remove that piece because that was that person's influence. And oh, that's not me. So it took me a really long time to be more like that. And I think I'm finally in a place where I do trust myself more. But that is difficult. And it also, I think, has to do with the time. You know, more women are allowed now to like actually be genuinely themselves publicly. And I think that that is helpful. As an older woman, I look to these young women and I'm like, thank God you're doing this because now I get to relax. <laughs> When you speak about being heavily influenced by the nature of the circumstance, you being a working child and a famous child, I had this realization, I think, like maybe four years into my career in Los Angeles, where I was like, oh, we're like racehorses. We're like kind of kept in our stables. And then when we're not racing as well, maybe we're put out to pasture. Like in an odd way, it kind of comforted me. It made it less personal, the idea of being a commodity. Yeah. We're also our own small business. But that framework helped me in making it, like I said, I guess, less painful on the personal side. Yeah. I mean, I talk a lot about that. Like, I don't know why, but I've gone back before and read old interviews, like from when I was a teenager. And I talk about being put back in my box and taken down off the shelf. <laughs> and I'm like 14, you know, saying these things. So I very much got that early on. And that's the other thing I think that's dangerous about, you know, people ask me all the time about kids being famous and working. And I think the thing that is dangerous about that is that as a child actor, you learn what we learn as an adult, that as a child, I think you take it more to heart. And as an adult, you're able to manage it better, but that... Nothing is more important than the production. You are not as right. important as the production. Uh -huh. No matter what happens, this movie is getting made and you need to show up and everything you feel is second. Like, how are you supposed to interpret someone always escorting you to the restroom? Right. So special. <laughs> yes. Like, you feel valuable or they think you might try to escape. You are a very precious commodity, but you're not a human because your feelings, like, like, and as a kid too, and I think that anyone who's been in this business for a long period of time has a story where something incredibly deeply personal occurred, a death in the family, pregnancy, birth, something, and you just had to work anyway, you know? Yeah. There's been so many of those. And I think that messaging as a kid was a little bit damaging for me because it really taught me that I myself came second and that everything else was more important. Was it hard for you as a working kid to develop friendships? I learned very early on. I remember when I went to do my first movie, I came back after three months and the first day I sat down with the little girls that had been my friends 
and started telling them about what I'd been doing. And they immediately like wanted nothing to do with me, just didn't want to talk to me. And I realized that they felt like I was bragging. So I never spoke about what I did when I came back to school ever again. And it totally worked. I had two lives. It was really interesting. That must have been lonely, though. I mean, there must have been times when you wanted to share an experience. I don't know. I mean, I think as a kid, you just accept these things and compartmentalize. You're just like, okay, this doesn't work in this environment. I'm not doing it. I remember wanting more of the experience of my friends than I wanted the work experience, even though I loved the work experience too. It was just, I don't know. It was different. Do you still have friends from that time period? I actually reconnected with my freshman year of high school best friend, Julie, when I went to Berlin two summers ago. So that was really funny. And it was really funny. We were two very weird 13-year-old girls who like hung out in her attic bedroom all the time and like watched MTV. Yeah, I remember those days. I met her as an adult and it was so fun. And my son got to meet her. We reconnected and it was really interesting. Oh, in what way? She was the same person. And we had a very similar dynamic that we had for that like year that we were really good friends. And and I'm still really good friends with my like late high school best friend, Sean. How old were you when you first felt like you were in love? I don't know. Well, hmm. <laughs> I would say, and this sounds really annoying and cloying and stupid, but I would say that the first time I really fell in love in a healthy way is probably this marriage that I'm in now. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's why I didn't want to say it because it sounds really like, oh, it's really cool. No. But really, truly, I think that a lot of my relationships in the past had a lot to do with unhealthy things that I was looking for. And I don't know if you can call love, but I don't think things that aren't good for you should be called love. I like that. When you were younger, was there a big difference between your peers in the normal world and in the industry? I have to say, I thought that kid actors seemed really strange to me because I had a normal kind of version of my life. And so all those kids that I knew at home seemed like normal, real kids. And then the kid actors I would meet who were very mature always felt really strange and made me uncomfortable. If anything in the entertainment industry was made illegal, how would you earn a living? Oh, wow. I have a lot of very actressy answers, like interior decorating and yeah, good. No. being a therapist. All right. I think I'd be a pretty good life coach also. All right. So interior decorator and therapist. Yeah. Tell me about some of your weird loves or collections, anything you're interested in. I like a lot of true crime. I know a lot about true crime. I mean, I have two kids, and so I feel like I don't have a lot of hobbies. I know. (laughs) I'm sure you can relate. Totally. Not a lot of time for hobbies. Like, I've become a significantly less interesting person. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I'm so boring now. I, like, watch the same TV shows as everybody else when I can. The only thing that I do that I think is different, because people look at me funny when I tell them this, is I really like this show, Life Below Zero. I love Life Below Zero. It makes me feel really safe. And so it's on in the house almost all the time. I love it that you love that. I was just introduced to that show like a month ago. I think the idea of the fascination with people that have these survival skills, but that are drawn to the isolation, I am drawn to that idea as well. When I was a kid, I loved the idea of Yukon. Mm -hmm. I felt very comfortable with the idea of being alone. (laughs) Yeah. No, I'm the same way. I think what I like about it is that it's possible. So I think very much for me, it's sort of like, well, there's always this. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Like you're fine and you will always be okay because you can always go to Alaska And live off the land. Yeah. Yeah. We'd be super qualified, Christina. Yeah. I think that is what makes me feel comforted. It's like the safety net is on my TV. And every moment it's like, no, 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 you're okay. Because here's your option. Should everything fall to shit. Can you tell me about your experience with the cast of Yellow Jackets? I guess when I was younger, I always felt this degree of competitiveness with other actresses. And then when I was on Mom, I found myself just you know, really enjoying this group of incredibly talented women. Maybe it's the gift of getting older. I totally know what you mean. And I do think it takes a really long time for those things to go away. And still, even now in my 40s, I like have little pangs of jealousy. And I'm like, no, (laughs) no, we are not doing this. 
And it is really amazing. The four of us older actresses on the show, we all really get along and support each other. And it is true, though. I mean, we all had our own storylines and our own characters. And we're all so different that it would be really difficult to be competitive with each other, I think. But we started a Marco Polo group and we all like supported each other and we would leave each other crying messages and then, you know, all kinds of things. And it was really nice. And it is the first time that I've actually been really close with the women I'm working with. So it's good. When we were making The House Bunny, our cast kind of took on the social dynamics of the story. Like the enemy sorority girls formed one group and then the outcasts formed another group. Have you experienced anything like that on Yellow Jackets? Yeah, I did. And actually with Misty as well, like everybody from the beginning was always saying, you know, oh, she's so funny. Oh, you're so funny. Oh, it's so funny. And I hated it. I was just like, I don't want to be funny. I don't want the character to be funny. I'm not trying to be funny. You know, like I was so uncomfortable with the idea that I was funny and that she was funny. And I realized only after we finished shooting what it was, like the line had blurred. And because with her, she's never in on the joke. It's always people laughing at her. That I was making all these decisions like from her point of view where it felt like I was being laughed at. You know what I mean? So I was uncomfortable with the humor because as her, she would have been. Right. So I definitely have had experiences like that. And it is really hard for me. And I still, even though I understand what it is now, I can still imagine myself shooting season two and someone being like, oh, it's so funny. And me just being like, yeah die, you know? Christina, this has been like my career. (laughs) Do you feel, really? Oh God. Because that makes me feel better because I thought it was just because I would call you a comedian and an actress. And I would then assume that you would be more comfortable with this than me. No, I thought it was just because like, I am not comfortable with being funny and like, didn't understand what it took mentally to do it. (laughs) No. The only conclusion I've come to is that I just have no idea what my face is doing. (laughs) because I was a really serious kid. It's shocking that I can't get out of comedy. It's shocking to my friends and family. I mean, it's shocking that I can make a living, but truly, this is all accidental here, and I still can't figure it out. That's so, (laughs) so funny. Yeah, I have it all the time, too, because I really don't feel funny. Uh Uh-huh. So anytime, like, even with the show, I said to them, I was like, you know that I do not consider myself able to be intentionally funny. Uh Uh-huh. So I'm not going to play this character for laughs. Uh Uh-huh. And they're like, oh, okay, all right. And then they're like, oh, my God, it's so funny. And I was just like, why... Oh, that weird laugh you do. Oh, you mean my laugh? You mean my... Right, yeah. Oh, your eyes, your crazy eyes. You mean just the way I naturally look at people. (laughs) And then, I don't know, it's so weird. And then you kind of feel like you can't admit that. Right. Because you should be like, "Mm -hmm." no, I know I'm a genius. (laughs) I know. I take comfort in the thought. It's like, okay, well, I'm playing this naive character with a lot of sincerity. Yeah, I'm being really genuine and my, yeah, yeah, my genuineness is just hilarious. It turns out my version of sincerity is funny. (laughs) It's really funny. Yeah, and it's interesting. I'm so glad to hear you say that. I'm really glad to hear you say that. Yeah, and it's weird to be uncomfortable with something that everybody's like, you're supposed to be really proud of yourself for. Oh my God. Truly for years, like the story of like my journey sort of being like a woman in comedy. I remember Charlie Rose asked me on air, you know, it's a morning show in New York. He asked me what comedic timing is. And (laughs) I wish I had just looked at him really like confused and like held the pause for an uncomfortably long time. I think that's it. But no, I said something stupid, you know, and then like we faded to commercial. I I was kind of caught off guard on sort of the analyzation of the technicality of like, I don't know, is it like getting hit in the head when the prop dude throws the ball perfectly and connects? I don't know. I really don't like questions like that. Or if they're going to ask questions like that, I'd rather them be like, what color is frustration? Do you know what I mean? If it's going to be like, come up with some random words for me. Right. At least make it like, Something you can answer. Right. Doing press back in the day, I haven't really had to do intense press for a long time, which has been awesome. But getting caught in those situations, ugh. Yeah. Like um, being forced to self-describe, to analyze yourself publicly. Yeah. I know it's really hard. And then you get to a certain age where you know if you say something, you're going to hear about it for a really long time. 
So like I just had somebody ask me like, what song do you think really identifies you and you could listen to and be the theme song for the rest of your life? No, what did she say? I said, I can't answer that. If you force me to answer, the smart ass in me is going to say La Cucaracha. (laughs) But, you know, I don't want to be tied to a song, (laughs) please. Or like, who would you want to play? You know, anyway, yes, I hear you on these things. The simple sort of clever answers to attempt to provide like a summation of who you are is a lot of pressure. Yeah. Christina, before we get to callers, I'd love to ask you about the idea of what home means, that feeling. Well, I think for me, like you mentioned, this idea of being kind of a vagabond, of being an actor. Yes, we were constantly on the road and everything. So I guess home for me is wherever all the people are that make up my family, you know, more than anything else. And I wanted to ask you, do you have a fear that some people would deem irrational? Yeah, I'm very, very, very safety minded to the point that people have said I'm paranoid. Like I lock every door. I will lock the bedroom door inside the house. I take one of those portable extra locks for the hotel room. Okay. Everywhere I go. All right. I really always make sure no one's following me in the car, check under the car before I get into it. Like as you're walking up in a parking lot, like I'm just very safety minded. (laughs) Well, but in your case, it's not irrational. I know. Cause like I read these crazy, horrible once in a lifetime horror story things. And so I'm just like, it could happen. It's never happened until it happens the first time. You mentioned being interested in true crime. Do you listen to all the podcasts? No, I mostly read a lot of news stories about this stuff and have watched a lot of documentaries over the years and like was obsessed with it in my 20s and read all the books about the Night Stalker because he was the most adept at getting into people's houses. So I wanted to learn how to make sure that he could never get into my house. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm also afraid of sharks. In any body of water, if it's a lake, I'll be like, I'm sure there is some animal that wants to eat me in here. I do not like not being able to touch the ground of any body of water. But I love the ocean and I like to stare at it. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm not a strong swimmer. I concede. I just don't want to be ever eaten or touched by a large fish. Do you have a favorite place in the world where you could see yourself living for a year after like the kids are grown with your husband or something? I grew up for like four years in Montauk, Long Island, and I really loved living there as a child. I'm sure it's so different now, but I would kind of love to live there. But I also, one of my biggest regrets is that I never lived in London. Well, there's still time. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, there's still a lot of time. You just got to get rid of the kids. <laughs> oh my God, it's going to be so long. <laughs> I know. I can't move till my son's 18. It's 10 more years. And there's always Alaska. Hi. It's an honor to meet both of you. You too. I'm here with Christina. She is awesome. And I'm grateful for your letter. Will you tell us, Jace, what's going on? So I've been with my partner for going on five years now. And we've got engaged, have animals together, have lived together for quite a while. And then last October, I kind of had a bit too much to drink and then went through his phone and found some inappropriate conversations being had with quite a few other people and pictures being sent and all that jazz. It was rough, but we got through it, you know, set some boundaries and wanted to just move past it. But I've had my suspicions come back up again and I don't want to go snooping again because that's not really who I am. That's not what I want to do. It feels awful, too. Yeah. And it's just stuff that you don't want to see if it is happening. Uh, (laughs) I know. I have a whole theory on like the curiosity element, but you were compelled for a reason. So where are you guys at now? So we were doing okay. And then things just kind of fell off and I confronted it a couple weeks ago and it's just been more and more off. We haven't really been like sleeping in the same bed. We haven't been talking. We haven't really had those moments together. And we actually are supposed to be going to Cancun for my 30th birthday in a couple of days. And I don't know if I want to go. So you're living in like a house of tension. 
When you guys had this last confrontation that led to you guys like not really speaking, will you tell us a little bit about that? So it wasn't really too much to say. I just told him I just feel like things have been off and it's just repeating patterns. Like I'm just seeing similar signs to how it was back when I, you know, got really suspicious. And, you know, I'd rather you just talk to me and open up and just be honest if there is something. Like I'd rather it just come from you than anyone else. And he's like, no, I promise nothing's been going on. I'm not talking to anyone. I would tell you, but it just hasn't mended. We haven't had any moments to make me feel comfortable with that being true. So you withdrew kind of at that point. The tension in the house right now with you guys not like sleeping together or communicating well, is he attempting, I guess, to engage? Not really, no. And I just kind of shut it down. Oh. So you're just avoiding each other. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it sound like he is, doesn't it? Kind of, yeah. So my question really was like, is it just in my head or are they just repeating patterns that aren't going to stop? And is it once a cheater, always a cheater? In your letter, you go into a little more detail about how you had a serious previous relationship, but you had also been suspecting that your current boyfriend, you went through his phone for a reason, right? Yeah, he was just like putting it upside down, avoiding using it when we're sitting next to each other um, turn off like all of his notification settings and was just being secretive. And, you know, he has a past where he has cheated on his previous relationships. And that was something he was honest about and open with. So I thought that was like a good sign. But I know I feel you on this. (laughs) Yeah. Doesn't always turn out. (laughs) Okay. So when you went through his phone a while back, how did that confrontation play out? Was there like a massive blow up? Were there tears? Did you guys break up briefly? Like what was the fallout from that? So there was a big blow up and it's mostly from my end. So I went through his phone like kind of late at night. So he wasn't aware. And I wrote a little sticky note that was like, you fucked up. We need to talk. And the next morning he came up and was like, "Okay, what do we need to talk about? I was like, well, obviously what I found on your phone And then I like showed him everything and it was like pictures and just inappropriate messages. And he said he never acted on it, never met up with anyone. It was never physical, just online or through messaging. Do you believe that? I do. I think I did. Now I don't know. And would that be okay with you if it was? No. I mean, I set clear boundaries. I'm not into an open relationship. I don't want to experiment with polyamory. Like, I just want monogamy. That's what I'm into. And want to be able to start a life and trust with someone. So I am curious about his reaction. Did he get mad at you for looking through his phone? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So he said that, yes, he does this stuff and it's only online. Did he say why? Did he get into like an emotional place with it? Yeah, he said that he needs like validation. Sometimes I'm not providing that to him. And for sure, when I get in my head and my zone, like I definitely kind of turn out as a partner and don't communicate well. But he was like, I just need validation at times when you aren't providing it. And it's like, okay, well, tell me, tell me that I'm not doing that and I'll do what I can to fix it. But don't go behind my back. Right. Christina, do you have thoughts? I do have some thoughts. My first thought is the idea that he is doing this because you are not validating him enough or it's something that you haven't done that makes him do this really makes me uncomfortable. We are never to blame for the destructive things that other people choose to do in their lives and in our relationships. You know what I mean? Yes, there's two people in a relationship, but you never get to say, I broke the bonds of this relationship because you didn't do enough of this. Like, that's not okay, I don't think. And I also think just in general, what I always think is a good idea is to look at everything and say, does my happiness outweigh my misery? Because we can be miserable all on our own. We don't need someone else to help us be any more unhappy. The whole point of being with other people is that they lift you up and bring joy to your life. Those were my impressions. (laughs) I feel like, Jace, you're going through the beginnings of a long, slow heartbreak. But here's the good news. You're awesome. You've got plenty of life to find awesome people. I want to give you my early assessment of advice and tell me how you think it feels. Okay. You're going to Cancun in two days for your birthday. 
You have a pit in your heart and your gut right now. And only time, sadly, can wear that away. But I do think you should ask him if you guys can have another conversation. I want you to say, I'm not quite sure I've communicated how much this hurts me. It just sucks for me right now. Like, I love you. I feel like you're comparing me to these other people that you have a mentality maybe of like the grass is greener. So I want us to really think about this over the next few months. If we did split up, we have a lot to untangle, but I'm about to turn 30. I want to do it with you. I want to have a fucking blast. I mean, this will be a solitary journey for you because I don't know if you can make him stop. I think that you've suspected this for a long time. And even if he did, he just may be in a place in life where he can't love you the way you should be loved, the way that you want to be loved. It's a hand you can't force. It's like the suck-ass realization. (laughs) Suck-ass. No, it is. It's suck-ass. Thanks, Christina. It's a total suck-ass realization. It (laughs) sucks. It sucks so much. And because it sucks so much, it's what keeps us, you know, fighting for things longer, I think, than we necessarily should. Because that feeling sucks so much, we avoid it, and then we just drag out misery. I don't know, Jace. Do you feel that way? Kind of, and that's kind of where my head's been going. And luckily, with this trip, I have five of my closest friends also going with us, so... Amazing! Oh, good. So you can really salvage the trip and just decide to have a good time and deal with it later. Mm -hmm. Deal with it after. Because, yeah, it's something we've all been looking forward to, so I don't want to just ruin it because I'm in my head or something, like... But what do your friends think? Are they involved in this? I haven't really been talking too much about it. I've kind of let a couple that are going with us know kind of what's going on. I think it would be helpful for you to talk to a good friend. Because sadly, I wish we could say, oh, you know, get him over here on this Zoom and we'll give him the what for. And then he'll be like ship shape and you guys will be getting married next year. But I think you've been suspecting this for a really long time. I want to look out for you, and I don't want you to be hurt. I mean, do you think he could change? It just feels like you've been feeling like this for over two years. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I want to feel like he can, and I've been trying. But recently, just with his behavior, it's been, I don't know if I will ever get there. Yeah, and you know, I think you got to say this stuff to him without anger, without blame or whatever, because it'll be easier on you if you can attempt to remain impassionate, which is the sad thing that happens with heartbreak as well, is like you just become exhausted. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you say to him, my heart hurts and I just want you to know that, but I really have to do some thinking. And he may say, I want to do whatever, I'll erase the thing. But it sounds like, Jace, he hasn't even been that emphatic about doing that or reassuring you completely. Am I wrong? Not at all. Then this is your journey because he's not fighting for you two. I think it's important for you to let him know that the (laughs) seed of the breakup has been planted. We'll just see how long it takes to grow. Because, Jace, I also don't want you to walk away from this feeling like you have to break up with him. You know, I really don't. I know that this stuff is hard. It takes time. You love him and you have a nice life together. I don't want you to put pressure on yourself. I just want you to assess. Okay, I can do that. Does that feel like a relief when I say this? Yeah, it's nice to hear from an outside perspective from not knowing either of us. Like maybe I'm not misinterpreting things and maybe it is just time to have that conversation and just be like, this is what's happening. This is where I'm coming from. Yeah. I want to see this through. I want to build a life, but I don't want to do it on my own. Be honest with him, Jace, if you can, like in terms of telling him, like, I love you. Because if you can vocalize those things, It'll just be a little more productive for you. And if you want to go as far as saying, like, I'm in a relationship where I love my partner more than they love me, at least in the way that I want to be loved, the way that I give and receive love. And I just want you to know that this is kind of what I'm going through. I wouldn't ask him again about the stuff, you know. I have a philosophy, Christina, and it took age, I think, but I don't want to know the details. I don't want that visual. I don't need to know the bedroom. I don't need to know the city. Mm -mm. I don't even need to know the person. No, it's too much fodder for the imagination. Yeah, 
it's just the realization of how much more painful it becomes yep. with the photograph you've created. So I would say these things to him. And you have the information. It's not that people are incapable of change. I just don't see it in this scenario. And I don't know what it means to flirt. But like, let's make the assumption, I guess, that he was just doing this online. I'm not quite sure what that is. Either way, it's still a betrayal of trust. Totally. I mean, whether it's in the flesh or not, especially this day and age, yeah, it's a total betrayal of trust. Yeah. I know this is going to be a rough journey for like the next six months. And I want you to protect your heart. Thank you. But will you please have a fabulous time in Cancun? Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah have a great time. <laughs> yeah, like this is yours. Yep. You're 30. Don't let anyone take it away from you. Thank you. I'll do it. I'll have a good time. Have Thanks. a great trip. Bye, Jace. Bye. Nice meeting you both. Nice meeting you. you. Bye. You gave beautiful advice. Well, I wasn't sure how strong I should be. <laughs> you were great because he was raw. You can tell. Hi, Wanda. Hi. Hi. How are you both doing? We're wonderful. Thank you good, so good. much. I'm here with Christina, who is just as lovely as she seems. Hi. It's so lovely to meet you both. It's very surreal, <laughs> but a big fan of both of you. And thanks for having me on. I really appreciated your letter. Will you tell us what's going on? Sure. So over the past two and a half years, I've gained quite a bit of weight, about 40 pounds, which I'm actually okay with. But of course, I've been working from home most of this time, and we're just now going back into the office. So I'm seeing people that I haven't seen in two years. And so with that has come a lot of comments about my weight from my coworkers. Ugh. Yeah. A lot of people asking if I'm pregnant. Oh, a lot of people just blatantly coming up to me and saying, wow, you gained weight. And <laughs> people are shocking in how comfortable they feel commenting on other people's appearances. It's really so surprising to me. I'm always shocked by it and it's consistent and I don't know why it surprises me. Completely agreed. When I get stressed, I lose weight and I lose my appetite I hate it when I get comments on it. Yeah. People just love to comment on how short I am. Like nonstop. <laughs> All they do. Yeah. Oh, hi. It's so nice to meet you. My God, you're short. And I'm just like, mm-hmm, great. It's so nice to meet you too. Right. Right. <laughs> People just don't seem to be able to help themselves. It's very strange. And it's something that I didn't think I had an issue with until it just kept coming up. Yeah. It's been over 10 people. Oh, God. Who do you work with? I don't know. And since I wrote in, I have told HR about it. And they did address it at an all-staff meeting. Of course, not specifically saying me, but just saying don't comment on appearances. That's just unacceptable. However, you know, that was only about a week ago. So who knows what will happen with that? I also, the nature of my job, I have a lot of events I have to work and I face the public. So I'm seeing people outside of my coworkers that I also haven't seen in ages. God, so it's like you are doing great. You're feeling fine. And suddenly these assholes are like, wait a minute. Yeah. Make, give you pause. I am so sorry. It's fine. Other than that, it's really starting to affect my work life. Like I go in two or three times a week, so not full time yet. But, you know, I pick the days that I think people won't be there, like a Monday or a Friday. It's kind of starting to affect me seeing my friends and family because I don't want comments from them. So it's kind of just taking over in a way that is kind of all encompassing. Christina, do you have thoughts? I feel like I've gone through similar things in my life, but I don't know that the way I dealt with it was the best either. You know, I just really had to focus on somehow not allowing people to piss me off, not allowing other people to sort of win in terms of destroying my mood and my happiness. And that's what sucks. It's like we can't control other people, you know? The only thing you can control is your own reaction. Not that that's fair either, though. Nobody should be putting you in this situation. So I don't know. It's a really tough thing. I used to get you're prettier in person. 
Oh, yeah. I actually, people will say to me, you look so much better in real life, better than you look on screen. And I'm like, well, it's a shame. That's how I earned my money then. Yeah, that's <laughs> awful. And it's weird because one, it's always, I think, hard to watch yourself. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But then the idea, like sort of, it could be justified as a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. I've had people say, oh, you gained weight. It looks so good on you. And I'm like, right. Well, I just don't right. appreciate you looking at my body in the first right. place. Right. Right. When people like, reveal how entitled they feel to judge you, like right. it's their place to tell you what their opinion is of you. I think that's really icky. I think that's the main issue for me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Keep me out of your brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And it's one of those things where I'm like, I can't be so vain where I'm walking around thinking everyone's like making a judgment. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like... <laughs> That was a lot. Yeah. I wonder if you could say, you know, with a smile on your face, well, that was awfully rude. But then like the person's going to engage and then you aren't safe. Like I would cry. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Like if I started to get into a confrontation with someone about this, I know I would probably get angry and cry. Yeah, I will say sometimes I'll just be like, no, I'm not pregnant. Or yes, I did gain weight and just kind of walk away. And other times I'm like, well, you know what? I'm actually okay with. Like I did have someone that said, well, you know what? We all gained weight over COVID and you'll lose it. It's just water weight. And I was like, you know what? I'm okay with it. <laughs> so it sucks like, that you even have to justify it. Yeah, you I know. know. It sucks. Know. Like people should leave each other alone. Who do these people think they are? <sighs> Honestly, and it's one of those things where I don't think people are trying to be mean. No, like, it's just so thoughtless. It's just, it doesn't yeah. even occur to them. Are they all older? Yes. Generational. This is a total generational thing. Yeah, I'm 30, and I would say most of the people are over 50. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, there you go. And then I did have, you know, my boss, she was like, you know, you just got married, so people probably think this is the time that you're going to get pregnant, and they're just, like, excited for you. I was like, well, that's not... The fact that there's this collective that views you as the young one. Yes. And they can say that kind of thing too. Oh, I could get into a whole other conversation about the way I dress. That's a whole other thing. Oh my God. I was a waitress at a retirement home at an old folks home. That was a hell of a job, but it just gets worse as they age. I know. These like 80, 90 (laughs) year olds. Oh my God. God, they felt so liberated to, you know. Oh, absolutely. When you met with HR, how did they respond? Well, I will say that the person I spoke to in HR is someone I've known for a few years now. I'm comfortable with her and she was very understanding and also appalled. Oh, good, good. Yes. Because you need to hear that part. You know what I mean? Yes. I would. I would need to hear the part where... It's like your jaw's on the ground. Yes, she was very surprised. So she did bring it up in the all staff meeting. I didn't attend that meeting because actually my boss said I didn't need to go to these all staff meetings until I felt comfortable enough to do so (laughs) because I just don't want to see anyone. This has been really hard on you. I mean, I knew that it was, but yeah. Oh, I am so sorry. But yeah, so. So they had this meeting and they may have not brought out your name, but was it apparent, do you think, to people? I'm not sure. I spoke to a few of my coworkers about it and they were like, I mean, she made it very clear that she was disappointed in people who were even bringing this up. But no, I don't think it was obvious it was me. And what I've heard through the grapevine, I'm not the only person that's had comments on their appearance. So that kind of <laughs> didn't make me feel better, but it made me feel yeah. more like, okay. Yeah. And I will say it's changed a lot in the past couple of years. A lot of people more my age have been hired, which is wonderful. But yes, the older people have always kind of called themselves like my work mom or even my work grandmother <laughs> to the point where it's like, so we're not colleagues. I'm like, right. you're inferior, like I'm your child. Right. It's a very strange kind of dynamic. One that I think has changed recently because there are a lot more younger people that work at my job now, but still didn't prevent that. So (laughs) This is too much. You don't need eight ants. Exactly. And, you know, we're not even friends. Right. We need the separation. And even my own mother isn't saying things about my looks. It's like, oh, she knows I was just joking. Right. Right. If you're not happy there, life is short and you're young and you're beautiful and It's a perfect time if you guys can financially make it happen. I think it should be a priority. Yeah. 
I think so too. Wanda, thank you so much. I know our listeners will really appreciate our conversation. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Christina, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. This was so fun. Congratulations again. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye, Christina. Bye.